So if you have a Bible with you, I would just invite you to have it open to 2 Corinthians 3. We've been in this series going through this letter Paul wrote to the Thessalonian church a long time ago, and I've really enjoyed it over the past couple weeks. I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll dive in looking at this. Okay. Father, I am so grateful um, that you're with us every day, and especially today as we come to you and we admit we need you, we need your help, Um, you are doing good things among us. You've brought and encouraged people to serve us as deacons. May you bless them. You're using um, this day for our kids to learn about you. I thank you, Jesus, that that can happen here today. And we come to your word right now just asking that you help us still. That from your word are the things that we stand in need of today. Words of hope, encouragement, direction, wisdom, even challenge. That that is what you offer us today in your word. And we want to be willing to receive that. Um, So may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be holy and pleasing to you. Amen. I, um, this is the season of gardening, right? May and June, and I have been trying to be a little more on it with my lawn care, because to be honest, historically, my record is not good. And I, uh, so then I specifically wanted to have a better handle on the weeds. So I think I have a few pictures maybe. I, you know, they take over everything, to be honest. Like, they go everywhere, um, and so I've been trying to figure out how to have a better handle of this. My, thankfully, this is not my yard. Um, but even still, you can imagine even far worse yards than this around our city today where just they, they come up. Now, I know that there's probably like 10% or 15% of us here that know that the best way just to kind of handle this problem is just to mow over it and pretend you don't look. I know that. But I've been trying to get my yard healthier, and one of the key things is, like, you got to get it at the roots, right? And I was just, I, there's a couple days over the past couple weeks, I lost track of time with my little manual weed, weed remover, and I just hours later realized, what just happened? And I just, you know, you go at it, trying to get a better handle of it. And even one of my neighbors, he came by and he said, you know, I could give you my stuff if you want. And the truth is, there's, there's a couple truths. One is that we have a lot. This time of year, weeds are going to go everywhere. It's very hard to get rid of it. I know that. Thank you. But two, that you want to have the right strategy for the problem. That, you know, getting to the roots is good. You want to have the right strategy to actually get at the problem. Like, honestly, me spending all my energy and time on my hands and knees trying to get up roots might do some good, but that's probably not the best strategy when I come back around next week and realize, oh, I missed 100. So you want to have the right strategy for the problem. And and I think part of this in life is that we want to be clear about what is God's ultimate end? Where do we actually want to go and end up? So that, and then also use God's advice for using the tools to get to God's ultimate end, where he wants us to go. And so I look at this letter. It's unfolding in all these amazing ways. It's talking about people following Jesus and trying to find the ways to follow Jesus that are going to allow their lives to be totally transformed. So people in this church are growing in their faith in this letter. They're growing in their love for each other. They are tackling the difficult issues in their world and combating them with truth. And that they're finding favor from God in ways that is surprising, that they're even grateful. We talked about gratitude last week, that these people who are resilient are also really grateful people. They're not just people looking far and wishing that they had something different. They're really grateful for what God has done because God is good. And so today, I want to just, just a little bit of a roadmap. I want to look at how God asks the church based on this passage to pursue God's ultimate end. How does he do it? Which, spoiler alert, is prayer. How we pursue God's end is prayer. And then I want to look at a few items in this passage that talk about what does God say we should pray for? And then what is the result? So how do we pursue God's end? Prayer. What are the ways that we can pray? 
and what's the result if we pray the way God asks us to pray, all right? I'm just going to reread verse 1 just to kind of get us going here a little bit. It says in 2 Thessalonians, which is not a short word, 2 Thessalonians 3, 1, As for other matters, brothers and sisters, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored just as it is with you. So how can we pursue God's ultimate end? It's prayer. Prayer is one of the means by which God advances his mission in the world. I'll say that again. Prayer is, not, is one of the means. It is a means by which God advances his mission in the world. Paul is an experienced pastor at this point, and he is reaching out to these people in this letter and saying, I need you to pray for me. Because when God hears you pray, he's using your prayers to advance his message of Jesus. And that when you pray for me, as I've seen it, when I pray for you, God's mission advances. So Paul, what he's trying to do is he's trying to basically offer an example, saying if we want the goodness of God, this good vision of the world restored in Jesus, to take place, and we're passionate, we're excited about that, then you need to pray. He's really encouraging. He's saying, you need to pray. This is one of the ways that God responds. He uses what we pray to do. And it's not just in this letter. Paul talks about prayer this way in a lot of his other letters. You can look at it in his last letter to the first Thessalonians at the end. But I'm just going to read two examples. One's from Romans 15. He says this, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Paul's a high-stakes person, and he, he basically goes at it. When it comes to the things that really matters, he's saying prayer is one of those things that has to be there. Pray for me. Join in my struggle by praying to God for me. You can also see this in Philippians. This is another example. Philippians 1.18, yes, I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. My belief, what Paul says there, my belief that you are praying for me secures for me a confidence that God will offer rescue to me and deliverance for me. Prayer is not a place where we are totally in control, but more acknowledging that we're not. You know, Paul's going through a difficult time in his ministry in the behind the scenes of this letter. He knows the church is struggling he's writing to, and he himself, he goes to new cities and people outright reject him. He gets thrown in prison. He nearly gets killed. But he says that prayer will help, will help advance the mission of God, not because his circumstances are okay, but because he believes that God will use those prayers to create a safe environment for his mission to grow. And so, I just want that to be clear, because that's a very important point for everything I'm about to say. We can have all these amazing strategies for how we think God is going to save the world, rescue the world, you know, but the truth is that God has his own plan, and we're just playing catch-up a lot of times, (laughs) trying to figure out exactly, God, how are you moving, how are you working, and how can I be part of that? But from the Bible, we see principles that just have to be part of that process for how we connect, and prayer is one of them. Looking at the rest of these verses, what are the few items that Paul prays about? Because I think they help us think about some things we can pray about. If I want to pray in such a way to get at God's end, what he ultimately wants to do in the world, what are some things I can pray about? Well, what Paul offers you know, suggest is, is are things like protection and rescue. He says, God offers us protection and rescue by choosing to faithfully respond to our prayers. His second prayer request is about protection and security. He says it in verse 2, so chapter 3, verse 2, and pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil people, for not everyone has faith. But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. So not only is Paul praying that God's mission, the message of Jesus, would go out in the world, but he's also praying for protection. 
He's asking for these people pretty far away from him and saying, can you pray for me? Because I'm around people that don't know Jesus. In fact, they're against Jesus. They're going at me because I've said the name Jesus. But I want you to pray for me because, not because you're faithful or they're faithful, because God is faithful. God is the one, when I come back around, how do I sort out the mix of a confusing world of conflict and struggle? God's the one who's faithful. God's the one that provides strength. God's the one that protects. And so he's trying to say, hey, not everyone is going to offer this, but lift up your prayers. So I think about a lot of times, what are the things we pray about? I, um, I will be honest, as, you know, we're Father's Day here, but I had to work through some of my own personal father frustration earlier this morning, where I was like, oh, I, I, you know, because the truth is, like, we want every kid to be welcome to worship in our space. It's so important. And you should expect me as a pastor to walk that out and welcome that. But I'm like, oh, I just want to have control and to be able to have this way. And I was worried that some of what was happening might have been a distraction But a lot of that, honestly, is me trying to control the situation and not just trusting trusting God that he's going to work things for his good, that he's truly faithful. And so what we pray about sometimes reveal our desire for control, our focus on one thing and not on the other things. I'm a dad at dinner table, and I realize that when we pray, we're maybe not praying for everything we could pray about. I know that what we pray about says a lot about what we care about. Even like in a church like this, what we celebrate shows, us, shows what matters to us. And so I would just say, connected to this, Paul is asking for prayers of protection. He's asking for, you know, for help and security. And I think about the fact that we need a full diet of prayers to help us. Not just prayers where we say, God, help me with this. God, give me this thing that I need. But all these prayers that help us acknowledge, God, you're good, you're worth it. God, I repent, I'm sorry, I messed up, I fall short. And so I, um, I think that a full spread of prayers is what's needed, and Paul's trying to give us an example of that. I'm going to keep going, okay? So part of this is that Paul's giving an example of different ways to pray as part of advancing God's mission. And the result... So what's the result? If we pray in some of the ways that God, the Bible, talks about, what's the result? The result of persistent prayer, so not just prayer that's one time, but a few times, the result is confidence and clarity for what faithful obedience looks like. And I say this because the truth is that we're not always very clear about what faithful obedience looks like. Paul is on his own space And he knows that even as an apostle, he needs help to know very clearly what direction he needs to go. And he's praying for this church that needs direction for where to go. And the answer is prayer, persistent prayer. Let me read verse 4 again. We have confidence, so this is Paul speaking, I have confidence in the Lord that you are doing that you are doing and, the will con- and will continue to do the things we command. He says, this is the last verse of our passage. May the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. What does it not say? It doesn't say that when you pray, you're going to have every answer to every question you lift up. It doesn't say that you're going to know everything you want to know, especially what you want to do. But what it does say is that if we go to the Lord, ask him to direct us in his love, that we can tap in to what it's like to persevere. What we need to stay on solid ground and stand firm. What we need to know what faithful obedience looks like. I think I've said over the past couple weeks, and I just want to, like, sometimes the response in following Jesus in life is not having the answer. But knowing and following through with what faithful obedience looks like. And I say that because a really key piece of that is prayer. Prayer. That we commit to pray, and in prayer, prayer is a relationship where you basically realize, like, wow, I am not on the same page as God. I got some ugly stuff in my heart, and I need him to do some heart surgery. But if I can do that work, I can confess that, I can trust God, then on the other side of it, not only am I closer with God, but then now 
I can, ha- I can have more clarity about like, this is what faithful obedience looks like. The things around me are a mess, but I can trust that I can follow through with God, and that means that I'm gonna love my wife, my neighbor, the way that I know I'm supposed to love my wife and my neighbor. I can love my kids the way I'm supposed to love my kids because I'm called to care for my kids. I can respond to this thing and that thing the way I know I'm to. I can't fix everything, but it does give me the focus, the challenge, the strength, and the confidence to follow through with faithful obedience. The tough thing is if you do that kind of like if you picture me, your poor pastor, on, doing a bunch of weeds. If you're trying to do it on your own, you might not have the right strategy. But I think a strategy of persistent prayer seeking God is always what we need to do the heart check and to prepare to go out and do what God's ultimately called us to do. So, I, and I, want, to lift, I want to lift up what Ian e. Bounds says. Ian e. Bounds is this author on prayer, really, he's written a lot of really great things. He has a great book on prayer. And he says this, God shapes the world by prayer. The more praying there is in the world, the better the world will be, the mightier the forces against evil. So I ask you, and my, I think my homework I would give all of us this week is to go home and take a look at what are the, what's our prayer life looking like? How's it looking? Because I even do the self-assessment and realize that I am not praying nearly as much as I should. My rhythms of prayer are, maybe they're okay, but it could be a lot better. And so I look at what does prayer look like the way Paul says is so important. He basically is throwing out prayer requests. And I know a lot of times prayer requests end up becoming asks for sentiment versus responses of action. So how does prayer, how we actually advance the mission of God? And so I want to give you three ways that I would encourage you to ask yourself this week. How do I pray? To advance God's mission in the world, I would encourage you to pray for the wisdom and grace you do not have. I think about Solomon. When Solomon's becoming king and God says, what what can I give you? Ask me and I'll let you know. And he asked for wisdom. And so I think one of the first steps in prayer being part of advancing us and getting us out into the mission of the world is knowing that prayer is where we go when we need to ask for the things we don't have. I don't know how to respond to this situation. I don't know how to extend grace to this situation and this person. Ask for God to show you how. Because to be honest, prayer is basically acknowledging that I don't know how to bring your kingdom to this world, Lord, so show me. I will trust you and humble myself totally before you, God. But I need to be at your feet, and I need to know that you are the king of this kingdom and not me. And so I, the first step to advancing God's mission in the world is praying for the wisdom and grace you do not have. The second, I would say, is to pray for the strength and resolve of others. What I want to lift up is that something in like a letter like this, in these few verses, Paul's writing with a group of people, writing to a church with a group of people, what he's tapping into is not just one person tucked away praying for the world. What he's tapping into is how strong the family of God is when everybody prays for one another. That the strength and resolve that comes in part of the mission of God comes from people coming together and praying for each other. And I just say that that is something that we have to be about. Trying to tap into how do we be a community that prays for one another and not just a special few interceding for everyone, which throughout all history that certainly happens. You have people praying for the people of God, people praying for deliverance in different places But I look at how we could grow as a community, and I know we could grow as a community that prays even more for one another, for the strength and resolve, contending, helping each other fight and go forward. My last thing is to pray for boldness in God's clear direction. A.W. Tozer says this, to desire revival at the same time to neglect personal prayer and devotion is to wish one way and walk another. I, I, I believe in this vision that God gives us of a world being made new. 
and of his kingdom coming and meeting everything we might face in this world, all the challenges we face, being a church in Canada who doesn't know Jesus, who are coming up with their own ideas of how to seek the good in the world apart from God's word, his wisdom, and his love, we are a lot. We have a battle that goes on out there, and it's not for us to win. God's won it. But the truth is that we need boldness. We, know, we need to know how, where, the places, where are the places we need to stand strong and really clearly. Where are the places we need to be incredibly gracious about? And what's that direction for how we could be faithful, obedient? That's, those are the things we need to pray about. So I look at these three things. They're going to be up on the screen. Praying for wisdom and grace. Pray for the strength and resolve of other people. Pray for boldness and God's clear direction. I believe at a dinner table thing where you kind of rank, you, my, always helping my kids, just pray for anything that comes to mind. God hears it and he loves you. So, all right, we're gonna thank God for those weed that you just picked because my, my son loves to pick weeds because they're like flowers to him. Thank God for anything because that's gratitude. But I think the more and more you read God's story, the more and more I think we're challenged to focus our prayers in specific ways and that God chooses to use our prayers to advance his kingdom. I'm going to invite our worship team up, and I think how I'd like to close is very simply that I think a lot of us get caught up in the hands-on weeding business, and that maybe we don't quite have the strategy God wants us to use for how to respond to the issues of the world. I don't know if there's a, what your prayer life looks like, but what I would say is that if you, can hear, if you hear anything from me is that committed time every single day to start the day in prayer, to have prayers around your meals matters. It shapes everything. It shapes your conversations, your attitude in the day. If anything, for that prayer space to just be the place where you can say, I need help, God. This day is overwhelming. The things I'm trying to figure out, I don't know how to do. I need help. And that we know through a lot of examples in the Bible and in our life that when we do that, God can help us. And so I'm going to pray and just ask us, you know, invite us to kind of just enter into just acknowledging what we need from God. And then our team's going to help us with a response, okay? Um, Father, I thank you so much um, for how you are with us, even when it's the situations we face are beyond what we can possibly ask for or imagine. And not all of us are in the same place of praying, talking with you, but I know that truthfully, when we do pray, you hear us. And I pray that all of us would feel encouraged that we want to pray more because part of praying is being closer to you and admitting that we need help. And there's not always a clear language. Maybe we have different words that we use. But part of it is reaching out to you and just saying, God, I need help. I don't know how to do this. I've messed up in this relationship and I've messed up in the situation and that I need you to help me. And I pray, Lord, that if we commit to those things, you will bless us with, bless us with those things that I just lifted up that you would bless all of us with increasing wisdom and grace, the kind of wisdom and grace we don't have on our own. I also pray, Lord, for just more and more boldness and clarity, Lord. How do we be bold in a world that is so confusing and conflicted? Help us to not be less bold people who follow you, but people who love well. I ask that you lead us and help us to know how to respond, Father, I pray. Um, help us to sing and go home and want to take a look at our lives and say, I think my prayer life can be better. What does God want to do with my time with him? Um, I lift these things up to you in God's name.